the Catholic Men's Podcast, helping you find good works of literature for the Catholic gentleman. All Creatures Great and Small, written by James Harriet. This chapter from All Creatures Great and Small is the only one that's really worth reading out of the whole book for me. I would discourage anyone from reading this book because there's a good deal of vile language in it and the fact that it all devolves into a romance at the end. But I once had dreams of being a veterinarian one day, and this story opened my eyes as to what a tough profession it truly is, and I quickly reconsidered. That's the whole reason why I'm reading this story, just to show the hard knocks that a veterinarian goes through. It's fascinating, and I think you'll be fascinated with it too. We begin this story on the first day of Mr. Harriet's practice as assistant veterinarian to Mr. Farnan in Darrowby, England. The past five years had been leading up to one moment, and it hadn't arrived yet. I had been in Darrowby for 24 hours now, and I still hadn't been to a visit on my own. Another day had passed in going around with Farnan. It was a funny thing, but for a man who seemed careless, forgetful, and a few other things, Farnan was frustratingly cautious about launching his new assistant. We had been over into Litterdale today, and I had met more of the clients, friendly, polite farmers who received me pleasantly and wished me success. But working under Farnan's supervision was like being back at college with the professor's eye on me. I felt strongly that my professional career would not start until I, James Harriet, went out and attended a sick animal, unaided and unobserved. However, the time couldn't be very far away now. Farnan had gone off to Broughton to see his mother again. A devoted son, I thought wonderingly. And he had said he would be back late, so the old lady must keep unusual hours. But never mind about that. What mattered was that I was in charge. I sat in an armchair with a frayed loose cover and looked out through the French window at the shadows thrown by the evening sun across the shaggy lawn. I had the feeling that I would be doing a lot of this. I wondered idly what my first call would be, probably an anticlimax after the years of waiting, something like a coughing calf or a pig with constipation, and maybe that would be no bad thing to start with something that I could easily put right. I was in the middle of these comfortable musings when the telephone exploded out in the passage. The insistent clamor sounded abnormally loud in the empty house. I lifted the receiver. Is that Mr. Farnan? It was a deep voice with a harsh edge to it, not a local accent, possibly a trace of the Southwest. No, I'm sorry, he's out. This is his assistant. When will he be back? Not till late, I'm afraid. Can I do anything for you? I don't know whether you can do anything for me or not. The voice took on a hectoring tone. I am Mr. Soames, Lord Alton's farm manager. I have a valuable hunting horse here with colic. Do you know anything about colic? I felt my hackles rising. I am a veterinary surgeon, so I think I should know something about it. There was a long pause, and the voice barked again. Well, I reckon you'll have to do. In any case, I know the injection the horse wants. Bring some Ericoline with you. Mr. Farnan uses it. And for heaven's sake, don't be all night getting here. How long will you be? I'm leaving now. Right. I heard the receiver bang down onto its rest. My face felt hot as I walked away from the phone. So my first case wasn't going to be a formality. Colics were tricky things, and I had an aggressive know-all called Soames thrown in for good measure. On the eight-mile journey to the case... I reread from memory the great classic, Colton Reek's Common Colics of the Horse. I had gone through it so often in my final year that I could recite stretches of it like poetry. The well-thumbed pages hovered in front of me, phantom-like, as I drove. This would probably be a mild impaction or a bit of spasm. Might have had a change of food or too much rich grass. Yes, that would be it. Most colics were like that. A quick shot of ericoline and maybe some collardrine to relieve the discomfort, and all would be well. My mind went back to the cases I had met while seeing practice. The horse standing quietly, except that it occasionally eased a hind leg or looked round at its side. There was nothing to it, really. 
I was elaborating this happy picture when I arrived. I drove into a spotless, graveled yard surrounded on three sides by substantial loose boxes. A man was standing there, a broad-shouldered, thick-set figure very trim in check cap and jacket, well-cut breeches, and shiny leggings. The car drove up about thirty yards away, and as I got out, the man slowly and deliberately turned his back on me. I walked across the yard, taking my time, waiting for the other to turn round, but he stood motionless, hands in pockets, looking in the other direction. I stopped a few feet away, but still the man did not turn. After a long time, and when I had got tired of looking at his back, I spoke. Mr. Soames? At first the man did not move. Then he turned very slowly. He had a thick red neck, a ruddy face, and small fiery eyes. He made no answer but looked me over carefully from head to foot, taking in the worn raincoat, my youth, my air of inexperience. When he had completed his examination, he looked away again. Yes, I am Mr. Soames. He stressed the Mr. as though it meant a lot to him. I am a very great friend of Mr. Farnan. My name is Harriet. Soames didn't appear to have heard. Yes, a clever man is Mr. Farnan. We are great friends. I understand you have a horse with colic. I wished my voice didn't sound so high and unsteady. Soames's gaze was still directed somewhere into the sky. He whistled a little tune softly to himself before replying. In there, he said, jerking his head in the direction of one of the boxes. One of his lordship's best hunters. In need of expert assistance, I think. He put a bit of emphasis on the expert. I opened the door and went inside, and I stopped as though I had walked into a wall. It was a very large box, deeply bedded with peat moss. A bay horse was staggering round and round the perimeter, where he had worn a deep path in the peat. He was lathered in sweat from nose to tail, his nostrils were dilated, and his eyes stared blankly in front of him. His head rolled about at every step, and, through his clenched teeth, gobbets of foam dripped to the floor. A rank steam rose from his body, as though he had been galloping. My mouth had gone dry. I found it difficult to speak, and when I did, it was almost in a whisper. How long has he been like this? Oh, he started with a bit of a bellyache this morning. I've been giving him black droughts all day, or at least this fellow has. I wouldn't be surprised if he's made a bloody mess of it like he does everything. I saw that there was somebody standing in the shadows in the corner, a large fat man with a head collar in his hand. Oh, I got the droughts down him right enough, Mr. Soames, but they haven't done him no good. The big man looked scared. You call yourself a horseman, Soames said, but oh, I should have done the bloody job myself. I reckon he'd have been better by now. It would take more than a black drought to help him, I said. This is no ordinary colic. What in blazes is it, then? Well, I can't say till I've examined him, but severe, continuous pain like that could mean... A uh, torsion, a uh, twisted bow. Twisted bow, my foot. He's got a bit of a bellyache, that's all. He hasn't passed anything all day, and he wants something to shift him. Have you got the Ericoline with you? If this is a torsion, Ericoline would be the worst thing you could give him. He's in agony now, but that would drive him mad. It acts by contracting the muscles of the intestines. Good heavens, snarled Soames. Don't start giving me a bloody lecture. Are you going to start doing something for the horse or aren't you? I turned to the big man in the corner. Slip on that head collar and I'll examine him. With the collar on, the horse was brought to a halt. He stood there, trembling and groaning as I passed a hand between his ribs and elbows, feeling for the pulse. It was as bad as it could be, a racing, thready beat. I averted an eyelid with my fingers. The mucous membrane was a dark brick red. The thermometer showed a temperature of 103. I looked across the box at Soames. Could I have a bucket of hot water, soap, and a towel, please? What the devil for? You've done nothing yet and you want to have a wash? I want to make a rectal examination. Will you please bring me the water? Lord help us, I've never seen anything like this. Soames passed a hand wearily over his eyes and then swung round on the big man. Well, come on, don't stand around there. Get him his water and maybe we'll get something done. When the water came, I soaped my arm and gently inserted it into the... 
So he analyzes the horse, and he figures out that there's a big tympanitic mass which should have not been there. As I touched it, the horse shuddered and groaned again. As I washed and dried my arms, my heart pounded. What was I to do? What could I say? Soames was stamping in and out of the box, muttering to himself as the pain-maddened animal writhed and twisted. Oh, the bloody thing! The big man said nothing. He was in no way to blame, but he just stared back stolidly at Soames. I took a deep breath. Everything points to one thing. I'm convinced this horse has a torsion. All right, then have it your own way. He's got a torsion. Only for heaven's sake, do something, won't you? Are we going to stand in here all night? There's nothing anybody can do. There's no cure for this. The important thing is to put him out of his pain as quickly as possible. Soames screwed up his face. No cure? Put him out of his pain? What rubbish is this you're talking? Just what are you getting at? I took a hold on myself. I suggest you let me put him down immediately. What do you mean? Soames' mouth fell open. I mean that I should shoot him right now, straight away. I have a humane killer in the car. Soames looked as if he was going to explode. Shoot him? Are you stark raving mad? Do you know how much that horse is worth? It makes no difference what he's worth, Mr. Soames. He has been going through hell all day and he's dying now. He should have called me out long ago. He might live a few hours more, but the end would be the same. And he's in dreadful pain, continuous pain. Soames sunk his head into his hands. Oh, good Lord, why did this have to happen to me? His Lordship is on holiday or I'd call him out here to try to make you see some sense. I tell you, if your boss had been here, he'd given that horse an injection and put him right in half an hour. Look here, can't we wait till Mr. Farnan gets back tonight and let him have a look at him? Something in me leaped gladly at the idea. Give a shot of morphine and get away, out of it. Leave the responsibility to somebody else. It would be easy. I looked again at the horse. He had recommenced his blind circling of the box, stumbling round and round in a despairing attempt to leave his agony behind. As I watched, he raised his lolling head and gave a little whinny. It was a desolate, uncomprehending, frantic sound, and it was enough for me. I strode quickly out and got the humane killer from the car. Steady his head, I said to the big man, and placed the muzzle between the glazing eyes. There was a sharp crack, and the horse's legs buckled. He thudded down on the peat and lay still. I turned to Soames, who was staring at the body in disbelief. Mr. Farnan will come round in the morning and carry out a post-mortem. I'd like Lord Holton to have my diagnosis confirmed. I put on my jacket and went out to the car. As I started the engine, Soames opened the door and pushed his head in. He spoke quietly, but his voice was furious. I'm going to inform his lordship about this night's work, and Mr. Farnan too. I'll let them know what kind of an assistant he's landed himself with. And let me tell you this, you'll be proved wrong at that post-mortem tomorrow, and then I'm going to sue you. He banged the door shut and walked away. Back at the surgery, I decided to wait up for my boss, and I sat there trying to rid myself of the feeling that I had blasted my career before it had got started. Yet, looking back, I knew I couldn't have done anything else. No matter how many times I went over the ground, the conclusion was always the same. It was 1 a.m. before Farnan got back. His evening with his mother had stimulated him, His thin cheeks were flushed, and he smelt pleasantly of gin. I was surprised to see that he was wearing evening dress, and though the dinner jacket was of an old-fashioned cut and hung in loose folds on his bony frame, he still managed to look like an ambassador. He listened in silence as I told him about the horse. He was about to comment when the phone rang. A late one, he whispered. Then, oh, it's you, Mr. Soames. He nodded at me and settled down in his chair. He was a long time saying yes and no and I see. Then he sat up decisively and began to speak. Thank you for ringing, Mr. Soames, and it seems as though Mr. Harriet did the only possible thing in the circumstances. No, I cannot agree. It would have been cruel to leave him. One of our duties is to prevent suffering. 
Well, I'm sorry you feel like that, but I consider Mr. Harriet to be a highly capable veterinary surgeon. If I had been there, I have no doubt I'd have done the same thing. Good night, Mr. Soames. I'll see you in the morning. I felt so much better that I almost launched into a speech of gratitude, but in the end all I said was, thanks. Farnan reached up into the glass-fronted cupboard above the mantelpiece and pulled out a bottle of whiskey. He carelessly slopped out half a tumblerful and pushed it at me. He gave himself a similar measure and fell back into the armchair. He took a deep swallow, stared for a few seconds at the amber fluid in the glass, then looked up with a smile. Well, you certainly got chucked in at the deep end tonight, my boy. Your first case, and it had to be Soames, too. Do you know him very well? Oh, I know all about him. A nasty piece of work and enough to put anybody off their stroke. Believe me, he's no friend of mine. In fact, the rumor has it that he's a bit of a crook. They say he's been feathering his nest for a long time at his lordship's expense. He'll slip up one day, I expect. The neat whiskey burned a fiery path down to my stomach, but I felt I needed it. I wouldn't like too many sessions like tonight's. But I don't suppose veterinary practice is like that all the time. Well, not quite, Farnan replied. But you never know what's in store for you. It's a funny profession, Oz, you know. It offers unparalleled opportunities for making a chump of yourself. But I expect a lot depends on your ability. To a certain extent, it helps to be good at the job, of course. But even if you're a positive genius, humiliation and ridicule are lurking just round the corner. I once got an eminent horse specialist along here to do a rig operation, and the horse stopped breathing halfway through. The sight of that man dancing frantically on his patient's ribs taught me a great truth that I was going to look just as big a fool at fairly regular intervals throughout my career. I laughed. Then I might as well resign myself to it right at the beginning. That's the idea. Animals are unpredictable things, so our whole life is unpredictable. It's a long tale of little triumphs and disasters, and you've got to really like it to stick to it. Tonight it was Soames, but another night it'll be something else. One thing is, you'll never be bored. Here. Have some more whiskey. I drank the whiskey, and then some more, and we talked. It seemed no time at all before the dark bulk of the acacia tree began to emerge from the gray light beyond the French window. A blackbird tried a few tentative pipes, and Farnan was regretfully shaking the last drops from the bottle into his glass. He yawned, jerked the knot out of his black tie, and looked at his watch. Well, five o'clock. Who would have thought it? but I'm glad we had a drink together. Only right to celebrate your first case. It was a right one, wasn't it? I can't believe that his first day on the job involved capping some horse. That's just crazy, crazy luck. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this story, and please come back for more next time. Thank you so much for listening, and Godspeed. <laughs>